Welcome back to my channel, Balance Sheets Matter. Today we're going to be looking at Hims and Her Health. This is a subscriber request that I've got from a lot of different subscribers, so we're going to do a stock analysis on Hims and Her's Health. But before we get into the stock analysis, of course, make sure to subscribe to my channel, Balance Sheets Matter. I try to do daily stock analysis videos, so if you want to get ideas for potential stocks to buy or value traps to avoid, make sure to subscribe to my channel because I cover all sorts of companies, and if you do want me to cover a stock, leave it in the comments below and I'll see if I can get to it because I do try to cover subscriber requests as you can see. So basically before I get into the financials of this, I wanna just get a little bit more into what niche they're in and kind of get a little bit more outlay of that since they're kind of a fairly new company on the block and there's not a lot of financial history for them. So they're basically in this telehealth. And the one thing I'll say about the telehealth is it's a fairly competitive industry and it's a pretty low barrier to entry at the end of the day. But you can see basically Hims and Her Health, they kind of more specifically focus on selling some, you know, pres key prescription drugs to basically their patients so they connect the people with the doctor so they can get a prescription for these specific niches they're selling. This is compared to same to something like Teladoc, which is more working on finding a physician and they're not specifically marketing just for the prescription drugs, although that is something you can get from them. And you can see, a, for example, this company here, they're more focusing, oh, see so your doctor, what's your issues you have? They're not just pushing the prescriptions right in front of you, but there is a lot of other competitors for the prescriptions. And this is the one I'll say, kind of fear I have in this competitive industry when you are effectively just selling more of a generic prescription drug at the end of the day, there can be in the pricing wars. What are customers really gonna want? It's the same stuff from everyone at the end of the day. Are they gonna go for the big best price? Or is Hims and Hers branding basically gonna be good enough that they get loyalty with their subscribers and people are gonna to wanna to stick with them even if they pay potentially a little bit more money with them? Or is Hims gonna basically, Hims and Hers gonna get into more of the you know, pricing war and is that gonna affect their margins in the future? We don't really know any of this overall. From an e-commerce perspective, I actually think they have you know, a pretty good website. It's a lot more direct and clear what they're going with. Again, you go here, you see the products you can potentially get from them, the private label, they are generic, that potential moat of their branding could be enough for them to basically get that competitive edge and continue forward and become one of the winners in this industry. But aside from that, let's jump into the financials here. So let's pop up the 30 year financials. I can tell you there's not 30 years of financials to look at. Uh, so we'll go down here and you can see basically, oops, a little bit too far. Revenue here in the last 12 months, 710 million. The year ending December 2022, 527 million. The year before that, 272 million and 149 million the year before that. So I wouldn't say that this trajectory is gonna continue forever. They're expecting in 2025 to do 1.2 billion. But if we compare this to something like Teladoc here, you can kind of see that in the last 12 months, even though the year's basically not over, so we're getting a little bit of overlap from 2022, it's only 2.5 billion compared to 2.4. So once Teladoc got to this several billion dollar range and they're covering a much larger niche basically than Hims and Hers Health, their, uh, their basically growth rate has started to decelerate potentially quite significantly. And basically you can see their gross margins they've more or less stayed the same. You know, they've gone down a little bit, they've gone up a little bit, but you know, let's go back to hims and hers. You can see basically their gross margins have been increasing to about 80%. But again, since they are basically selling uh, generic, you know, prescriptions, if this is gonna be a question, if to continue that growth go growing, they're gonna have to basically cut their prices and that will affect the gross margin. And this is kind of one of these things you can see of what competitive advantage the company has. So you can tell they're starting to lose, in the future at least, you'll be able to tell if they're losing that competitive advantage and they're having to basically cut prices to gain more customers and keep that growth going uh, if their gross margin starts going down. That isn't happening yet, but that would be a warning sign to watch in the future for decelerating growth. Next, we can see basically a lot of money is going to selling and general admin, $528 million towards that. And this is only in comparison to $38.8 million in research and development. And again, I'm gonna do a little comparison to Teladoc Health here. We look say, for example, between 2019 and 2020, pretty comparable time for revenue there. And you look how much they put into research and development, quite a bit more than Hims and Hers Health with basically 65 million in 2019 and then 165 million in 2020. So again, they really aren't growing a lot on the research development. They're really at the end of the day, just a brand, a website to connect people with a doctor to get a prescription for specific niches. And they don't really seem to be putting money anywhere else other than that. So 
let's continue on with this here. As you can see, again, after all of that, they are losing money. Operating income, negative $52 million, although this operating income compared to the last two years is going down, so that is a good sign. And there is in the foreseeable future the next few years, analysts do generally seem to be projecting they will be going positive. If I remember off the top of my head, 2025, they're expecting about $1.2 billion in revenue and 100 million in EBITDA. So we continue going down and basically again, net income obviously is negative, EPS is negative and shares outstanding basically is increasing. Uh, there is basically a, like, you know, stock-based compensation, which is going on other than this basically big jump here when they basically, I think they were SPAC, so there was a big capital race here, but you do have further dilution going on because of the stock-based compensation. So you have to remember, even though they are growing, you are getting diluted more in the future, which is not a good thing for shareholders. So you do have to factor that into your growth valuation with them. So let's take a look at their balance sheets now. Current assets basically looking really good, almost $235 million, 193 million of that is in cash and cash equivalents. We compare this to the current liabilities of only 66.5 million. So this is a great current ratio. But again, a great current ratio is good in the short term and says, well, based on their current you know, liabilities and assets are not going to go bankrupt. But if you have a company that's losing money, this doesn't mean a lot. But again, they are expecting to be profitable in the next few years in the future. So this won't be a big concern, but if that doesn't happen, I would be a little bit concerned about the balance sheet if they don't start flipping the profitability in the next few years. Total liabilities only just under $70 million. And this is in comparison to their basically total assets of 389 million dollars giving them total stockholder equity of 320 million dollars again we should look at basically the goodwill and intangibles that's 110 basically million of goodwill there so take that off the total stockholder equity so that brings us to about 210 million dollars so there is kind of that buffer there which is pretty representative by their cash but and again you have to realize with these companies here that are small when they're losing money that just because you have a lot of stockholder equity right now if they burn all that cash away it's not going to mean a lot but from the projections i was seeing before it does seem to be like they could be profitable in the future so this shouldn't be a big worry but if they aren't profitable in the next year or two this is something i would start to seriously worry about now let's look at their cash flow statement as you can see a little bit of cash flow from depreciation pretty much just on replacement of the purchase of plant property equipment. They don't seem to be doing really any big investments. They're just a website. They're a telehealth company. There's really not much to invest in. They had a little acquisition basically in 2021 here, 46.5 million. But other than that, most of the growth seems to be organic. And then you can see here the stock-based compensation. In 2021, it was a little bit higher, a little bit lower in basically 2022, but it is ticking up again at $54 million in the last 12 months. And that's almost $17 million in the last quarter as well. And then we go down and we can see, well, in the last 12 months, their cash flow was actually positive. And again, this is just purely because of stock-based compensation because they actually are losing money. But at least that's good from the cash, you know, cash flow perspective. All you got to worry about is dilution. I don't typically look at insider uh, transactions, but just to kind of give you an idea of one of these headwinds that you have with these stocks is because you do have that st like uh, stock-based compensation going to, you know, to the insiders of the company and you can see they are selling that. So that does add overall selling pressure to the stock. So that is one of those things that can kind of keep that downwards momentum going. And so let's jump into basically the chart here because when you get chart like stocks like this that are heavily owned by retail investors, it's emotion which drives it a lot. And when you have the insiders also selling their stock when they get you know, compensated with it because that's basically how they're paid by the company, they're gonna sell into the market and that can you know drive the stock down. It can make people panic, it can make people sell as well. So at the end of the day for a stock like this, you actually wanna kind of look at it for where to buy and sell a lot just on the technical front. And we can see basically after they launched, it looks like their SPAC there, they you know, pumped up in price and just like everything else after that point, they faded down and created a lot lower below, a lot lower low compared to when they originally launched. And this is not speaking to good overall relative strength. And then the high they recently made, this is a lower high. It looks like an overall downtrend forming, although we don't know where they are right now. I would wanna be waiting for them to basically create a higher low at some point here and kind of then go up and then create another higher low to really show a reversal of that trend. Because right now there's always that potential that you're right now you're just catching a falling knife and it can go down and down and down. Well, I try not to get too much of my personal macro perspectives in on everything. I do believe there is a lot of macro headwinds going forward. There is basically the yield uh, 
yield curve inversion and when that unverse there's typically a recession ahead of us and slower growth and that's not necessarily the best thing for these companies that are smaller and losing money at the time so i would really want to see some basing going start seeing some better technicals before getting into a stock like this this isn't the type of stock i personally like to get in you see from a lot of my other videos i like to focus on larger companies consistent cash flows and i like to try them find them when they're relatively cheap, where this is a little bit more on the speculative side. But if I were to basically buy in Hims and Hers Health, I would want to see them start forming a little bit better technical pattern, create a higher low at some point here. Let me just get out a little tool here. I would want to basically see them get a little higher low here, go up and start reversing this trend. And once you start getting something like that, that's what I would want to see to get out and break this downtrend here. And that might tell me that it's a good time to buy the stock. Otherwise, you always have to worry about that. It could just keep falling and falling and falling. <coughs> Sorry there, but I hope you like this stock analysis. I hope it gave you some insights, both on basically the financial side, the niche they're in, and even the technicals as well. If you did like this video, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like the video, and I'll see you in the next stock analysis video.